welcome to the Business Greater Than You podcast, where we dive deep into the stories of men and women who have successfully transcended the frazzled solopreneur life and built productive teams with better lifestyle and income. I'm Nelson Bars, the founder and owner of Utah Independent Mortgage Corp. And I'm Liz Sears, founder and co-owner of My Utah Agents. We're excited for you to listen, interact, and grow with us. So please share your comments below and let's get started. And we are live. Good morning, Liz. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Nelson? Good. Welcome to our podcast. I know. Our first podcast. Episode one. Kind of excited about this. Absolutely. So I was thinking it might be fun for us to start with our audience by just telling them a little bit about ourselves and get to know them. Yeah. And so, or for them to get to know us, I guess is a better way to say it. So why don't you start? Okay. Let's do it. Um, My name is Nelson Bars and uh, I'm in the mortgage business. Been in the mortgage business for 20 years. I thought you were going to start off with like, I'm a Sagittarius or something. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was born at an early age. Born at an early age. No, yeah. All right, 20 years. In the 20 years in the business. Um, I didn't realize we'd started about the same time because I'm 21 years. So you started yeah. about 2001. Yeah, I don't know exactly when. I just keep track. I guess when my son was born, I keep track of it that way. Yeah. He was born during my first year in the business. So nice. almost 20 years. Um, and I've done a lot of different things with teams in that time. Mm-hmm. Um, I've almost almost always had uh, some other role in addition to being a loan originator. So I've been a full-time loan officer and team leader or branch manager or some kind of role like that. Um, in the recent yeah. three or four years, I've really uh, been able to build a company of my own. So I started my own business three years ago, Utah Independent Mortgage. I do find it interesting, you know, forgive mm-hmm. me for interrupting you, that our paths were a little bit more similar than even I realized, like just now talking to you, yeah. is that um, I started off um, kind of doing my own thing and in mortgages for 10 years, from mm-hmm. 2000 till 2010, being a loan originator, things like that. And then it's only been in the last two years that I've started building a team. And yeah. so 2010 is when I switched to the real estate side. So. Yeah, and I, I think I've always wanted to build a team, but it just hasn't, I haven't been successful with it until recently. I think yeah. the last three years, I, I've learned some things that have really enabled me to let go of, mm-hmm. you know, the mentality that I'm the best at every single thing on my plate. Well, you probably right? are. No, but then I'm that's... not. <laughs> I've learned that I'm not, right? Um, I've learned to um, hire well and train well, and that's part of what we want to talk about. We want to talk about in this podcast, um, the idea of building a business bigger than yourself. I remember a moment when I decided I want this to be bigger than me. I want to grow something uh, that can accomplish way more than I could ever do by myself. And that's the kind of the genesis of the name of the podcast, Business Greater Than You. Um, Anyway, so I have a company. We have 22 employees right now based out of Layton, Utah. Mm -hmm. And um, We've just been hiring like crazy. It's been an easy time to build a mortgage business, right? Yeah. With rates so low and um, lots of transactions happening. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's a little bit about me, about where I'm coming from. Tell us about your company. Tell us about your path. Uh, so uh, mortgages from 2000 till 2010 got into real estate and um, I love being a smarty pants. I love learning everything I can. So had a little bit of the same concept as you is, you know, working so hard to know how to do things and have the, um, I almost referred to it as having like all of those freak little knowledge pieces that you only use every four or five years. Like you have your core base knowledge of how to do the job Mm -hmm. well, and then just all the little interesting situations you find yourself in. And so, uh, and what I realized is working so hard to be the best I could be at my job benefited me and my clients, and that was it. And so kind of like you said about wanting to have a bigger impact and a bigger, um, just help more people. And so I realized that one way I could do that was coaching. And so I ended up getting hired as the productivity coach for the brokerage I was at. They had three different locations that I was the productivity coach for, and I just seriously fell in love with that. Mm-hmm. And um, then I started realizing now I'm impacting not just me, but also um, those agents and their clients and just wanting to grow from there. And then met somebody who had started a team and had a partner, but that partnership didn't work. She started with family. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that can sometimes be a bad way to go. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so anyways, knowing that she had partnered before, she asked me to teach a class with her. And as I was walking away, I was thinking, I wonder if she'd be open to partnering again. In fact, I 
refer to it as personal revelation because I had three questions pop into my mind that Mm -hmm. as I was walking down the hall, you know, ask her or ask Shannon if she's open to partnering again, what went wrong before and if she sees it happening again. So I just pivoted on the spot and walked back and, Hmm. you know, that was uh, about two and a half years ago. And now we opened our brokerage about a year and a half ago Mm -hmm. and uh, we've grown. So we have, uh, we went from two agents and two admin to eight or around 30 agents and eight admin at this point. Wow. And your brokerage is called My Utah Agents. My Utah Agents, yep. And so you have how many agents again? 30? Um, about 30, wow. yeah. And we just um, earlier this year opened up our second state. So uh-huh. we now have My Idaho Agents and we're licensed there. Yeah. And we expect to go across the nation. Yeah, so. cool. Well, congratulations. Thanks. I, I think it's important we point out some of the differences between what you and I are doing because I think there's two different ways we're coming at this. Most of the people that I've been hiring are hourly employees, staff, right? Yep. And our process and our, you know, the way we delegate and things like that is very different. If you're hiring agents who are on commission, yeah, that's a different level of hiring, right? Yeah. So in our brokerage, we have two different hiring paths that we do. So one is with the admin and mm-hmm. they come on as a salaried employee and they have um, set tasks and they have set hours that they need to be there. And then our, like you said, 1099 agents where it's 100% commission and Mm -hmm. uh, we have guidelines that they need to follow in order to be part of our brokerage. But the bulk of it is at their discretion, you know, how Mm -hmm. they approach the business. Right. So I think that'll be very helpful. And I'd like to also just talk about some of the goals of this podcast. I mean, one thing I hope that the listeners will recognize that we want this content to be valuable for every industry. I can think of um, just a lot of friends who are solopreneurs right now, Yeah. right? And they're not necessarily in the mortgage or the real estate business. They could be uh, attorneys, photographers, right? Or accountants, any any Uh, business. Bakery shop. Yeah, any business where you've got, you know, one person who's got the passion and starts the business Mm -hmm. and is doing all of the sales and all of the customer service and all the fulfillment and all the bookkeeping. You know, there's just a natural cap to what you can accomplish. And it's also a very difficult lifestyle. It's not a good lifestyle. No, and even people who have businesses that kind of run themselves. So I have a cousin who owns a storage shed unit and and there's still a mentality that happens when you think you need to do the whole thing yourself or you think that the only way to get ahead is to be very uh, penny pincher, which obviously you wanna be fiscally responsible, but there's some times where spending a little bit of money to get the marketing or the growth or something mm-hmm. will actually exponentially increase your profits long-term and you know right. create the lifestyle you want. Yeah, so that's the goal. That's the goal of our podcast is to, we're gonna interview um, people who've done this successfully, people who have mm-hmm. who have built a team. We're not necessarily focused on a huge business. You know, if you're an insurance agent, this will be really valuable to you. Even if you're yep. working, if you're a real estate agent or a mortgage loan officer, if you're working inside of a company, but you want to hire an assistant or two, you want to improve your, your profits and your lifestyle, this is for you. Right? Yeah, and you know, there's a lot of businesses out there that if you, put together, like, let's say you are an employee, Mm -hmm. but you want to grow your, like you were saying, your um, segment inside of the business when you can understand how hiring somebody to take the tasks off of your plate that don't generate as much money for the company. You could even use some of the things we're talking about in this podcast to pitch that to your manager, Yeah, get an assistant. Great. So should we jump into the first topic? I think that'd be fantastic. Okay. So this first episode. Oh, you know what? Yeah. Actually, let's introduce ourselves a little bit more. Okay. So my name's Liz Sears. I was born and (laughs) raised in Seattle. I moved to Utah to go to college and moved back home was my plan, but I met a Utah boy and got Mm -hmm. married and I'm still here. I've got four kids, um, four boys. They range um, right as of today. They're 15, 17, 21, and 22. Awesome. So how about you that way? Um, born and raised here in Utah. I also have four kids. Yeah. Uh, my youngest is seven right now. My oldest is 20. Uh, wow. Two boys and two girls. Lucky. That's what I tried for. But then, you know, I just gave up. <laughs> I was going to say, when you said you had four <laughs> kids, I was going to correct you and say four boys. That's very different than four, <laughs> four kids. Right. But uh, yeah, I live in Syracuse with my wife and four kids. And um, yeah, just I, I love this area. I love uh, four the mortgage business. Really yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. All right. So let's talk about why you need a team. The reason for, for building a team, uh, for me, you know, first is lifestyle. Absolutely. Definitely. I remember when I left my company to start my own 
little brokerage. Mm-hmm. My vision at first was just a one man show. It's just going to have a little office, go hang out, close the door, take a nap whenever I wanted to <laughs> and just, you know, do some loans and make, pay the bills. Right. Right. And, um, I quickly realized that was a horrible lifestyle. Why? Just, I mean, there's no vacation time, right? Yeah. There's no time off. There's really, there's no one to help you. Let's say you have two fires burning at the same time. You can't work on them both. Right? No. And so one of them's going to get, somebody's going to be disappointed. It's, it's yep. going to be bad news for your business, for your reputation, for your brand. Um, and I think you and I both experienced where we were on a vacation and something happened. And I remember being at Disneyland with my family and they were all in line to go on a ride. And I'm like, you're going to get up there to ride the ride before I'm done with this problem. So I had to mm-hmm. step out and just kind of deal right. with that. I wasn't mentally there. I wasn't, you know, participating with my family. And I'm like, this is a waste. This is not yeah. a way to live. You know, and I remember being at campgrounds, you know, constantly driving down the mountain to pull out my laptop and find some, <laughs> some Wi-Fi so I could yep. fix a problem or get an update to somebody. And it's not that, honestly, there were people at the company where I worked who were responsible to help me, mm-hmm. but either I wouldn't let them or they didn't care like I did about the customer and about their satisfaction. And so, yeah. And it, when you're working on your own as a hundred percent commission, you know that every time you ask them to help you, they're putting a pause on their business to help mm-hmm. you. And you can trade to an extent. Mm-hmm. I mean, it can work somewhat. Real estate, I think is a little bit easier to cover for each other because, um, just the nature of it as opposed to mortgages. Cause mm-hmm. there's just a lot more. Yeah risk. <laughs> yeah. Now the difference, when I look at the way my team functions, um, I have some very trusted assistants who are part of my mm-hmm. team who help in all points of the process. I can go on a vacation mm-hmm. and a lead can come in and get a phone call instantly yeah. from my assistant and they will get an appointment to meet with me for mm-hmm. when I come back and they'll begin working on their application, right? They'll, they'll yeah. have their credit pull, they'll submit some income documentation. And if it's urgent, if somebody really needs a pre-approval while I'm gone, it can happen because I have licensed and trained people to help do that. It's not that I've given up that hundred percent, but I have the backup, you know, and it's Mm -hmm. someone that I've trained and that I trust and that represents me the way I want to be represented. And that's the biggest thing is when you, um, if you don't have your own team Mm -hmm. and you're having other people help you, they do business their way like completely and having them do it your way is, uh, it's just not going to happen the same. Yeah. And so when you have your own team and you have your own training process and you have your own protocol and expectations and systems mm-hmm. in place, uh, that's where it actually feels seamless for your clients. Yeah. And that's what you really want. Your clients don't hire you because they want you a lot of realtors, a lot of mortgage people, a lot of people out there think that they hire you because they want you. And there's just that very select few, and that might be your mom, yeah. you know, your best friend. <laughs> but otherwise, the reason they hire you is because they want the quality of service that you're gonna provide. They want that experience. That's a great point, right? So. I think what held me back for a long time was thinking that that I would be disappointing people yeah. if I had a team, if I didn't do every piece of the process. I almost had a mental block where I thought those guys who did it as with a team and who didn't do the whole process were, were cheating somehow. Right? I know. Right. I had that same thought too. Yeah. It's like immoral or something to <laughs> You're like, hand some, how you do they, they, they didn't even do that. They <laughs> hand that person off from the very beginning. And, um, yeah. that held me back for a long time, you know, thinking that I had some kind of superiority because mm-hmm. I was slogging through every inch of the process myself. You know, one of the things that made a difference for me in shifting that mindset, cause same thing, I had that mindset was, uh, there's a lot of mortgage loan officers and realtors who are not high level professionals. They don't have the skills. They don't have the knowledge. They don't have the same professional full-time commitment. Mm-hmm. And so it's easy to kind of think of that as a different environment than let's say a doctor or a lawyer, a yeah. doctor or a lawyer that everybody already associates them with a high level professional. You would never expect the doctor to be the one calling to remind you of your appointment or to check you in when you get there or take your blood Hmm. pressure and weigh you or submit your insurance papers. Mm -hmm. But yet I was kind of expecting myself as the realtor to do all of those steps. And when I started investing my time and effort to know how to, you know, let's go ahead and keep the parallel with the doctor diagnose mm-hmm. and prescribe and, uh, you know, follow through that most important part, then investing my time to be 
amazing at that became more beneficial to my clients hmm. than me scheduling their showings or yeah. me putting up their sign. Wow. And so it helped me become a better resource and a better um, professional yeah. for them to hire. Well, that's a great way to look at it, right? I mean, the doctor nurse analogy mm-hmm. gets talked about a lot in my, I mean, a coaching program where they talk about doctor nurse, they try to oh. encourage us to, the hive, right? to build uh, the, co- the core, the core, the core, the, core. the hive. That sounds kind of cool. That's right. That's what I named mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the core is a nationwide coaching program for mortgage people. I, I've learned a lot from them over the years. Uh, they also coach realtors and they're big on teams, right? I think they're mm-hmm. big on teams because they want, they want me to spend a lot of my time prospecting yeah. and they know that it's not going to happen if I don't have a team. So right. it goes hand in hand. Right? It does. The other thing about that doctor nurse that I've noticed as a benefit is when customers do meet with me, they they value the time more. They they I've noticed that it's too. almost like they're they're not going to miss the appointment. They're they're going to respect what I have to say mm-hmm. because they they worked pretty hard to get to that moment, and they worked with some pretty awesome people mm-hmm. on my team. And and they I don't know I haven't even met them yet, and I I feel like they're half converted already, yeah. right? And the selling is much easier because they see this is a this is a very high performance team and a good organization. Yeah. So. so lifestyle, huge. Yeah. Um, so the second reason that we wanted to tell you about the good, well, back up, why to build a team for the money. And the reason why is because, you know, um, Nelson and I, you know, we were talking about how uh, people would say, do you want to double your income? And most solopreneurs say no, because they think that doubling your money means you have to double how hard you're working. Mm-hmm. But that's actually not the way it works. And so why don't you share a little bit what you were saying? Yeah, I mean, I just think... Um, there is a, I, I said earlier, there's a cap, right? If you're operating alone, there's a cap on what you yeah, can do. Yeah, there's only so much time that you have to invest. And if you have to do all hundred steps, right? then over and over again, that's, you're t- capped. Yeah, you're capped and you're actually in a, very, a pretty risky position. I, mm-hmm. for, for much of my career, you know, I just kind of flew what I consider to be uh, flying too low to the ground. I didn't realize at the time, mm-hmm. but now I see it as, um, I had a friend who's a pilot and he asked me once if it's safer to fly high or low, mm-hmm. right? And I thought, oh, low, low would be safer, right? Because you're mm-hmm. closer to the ground. Yep. And he corrected me. He said, no, if you're high and something goes wrong with your plane, you have a lot of time to adjust. You have mm-hmm. time to find a place to land. You, you know, you have options. Yeah. And, I, and I look at that with my business when I was f- kind of trying to close four to five loans a month with no team. It really mm-hmm. wasn't four to five loans a month. That might have been the average, but it was four or five and then zero, and then four or five and then zero, right? And then nine, and you're putting your kids to bed over the phone while you're driving to appointments. <laughs> yes. I did that. Yeah, I think the, the roller coaster <laughs> oh my gosh. of income on a commission job is, it comes from the fact that you cannot sell and service effectively yeah. at the same time. Right? Yeah, because you'll be selling and all of a sudden you have a bunch of loans or mm-hmm. transactions that you need to take care of. Otherwise, they're going to fall apart. And once somebody's hired you, it is immoral, in my opinion, to not do everything you can to get that deal to closing. And when you're doing that, your ability to sell diminishes because yeah. there's only so many hours in the day. I think most people feel that way. Right? Yeah. It's like I committed to get this done. And so I'm staying up late. I'm skipping my trip. I'm, mm-hmm. And what you're not doing also is prospecting and selling for next month. Yeah. Right. And since you tend to get paid three months after you prospected, mm-hmm. if it goes, you know, normal process, then that means three months later, you don't have any money right. or closings. And so, you know, this actually goes right back into lifestyle. I noticed that when I was on my own, about two months before my trip, I would actually already start to be tapering down my prospecting because I didn't want to be building the pipeline that would like take over all of my time. So I stopped prospecting and just closed out my deals. Mm -hmm. But then I'd come back from my trip and be like, (laughs) ah, I need to get some business going. Yeah. So Well, and I think, you know, that's, that's kind of flowing into topic number three. We started with number one, the lifestyle benefits, you know, why to build a team because it's a better lifestyle. And the second one is you can make more money with a Mm -hmm. team. It just is obvious. You know, actually, let me just add one more thing Mm -hmm. to that. Cause let's say that, you and I just do a ton of selling and then we have a team that helps with the fulfillment or servicing those deals that makes it possible for us to go back out and sell. And when you're hiring a team, uh, you pay them a 
portion of what you would have made. Mm -hmm. And so let's say we have to give 50%, you know, let's just pick a smack in the middle number is if I give 50% for them to finish out these deals that I've got, and I'm able to pick up six more, because honestly, like a lot of the heavy lifting is after you get them for a client. That's Mm -hmm. when all of these things come up and you have to deal with, you know, gathering documents or writing letters of explanation, getting everything that way, communicating and dealing with all of the conditions, Mm -hmm. you know, for, um, on the real estate side too, you're showing homes, you're facilitating negotiations, all of those things. Like what are the different pieces you can re or outsource? Mm -hmm. So that way you can gather more clients. And so for, for me, for real estate, um, a listing tends to be about 10 to 15 hours. Um, once we've signed the papers separate from actually, no, let's include what the transaction coordinators do too, 20, 25 hours. And then a buyer is 25 to 50 hours. And if I spend that time going and finding another client, I can definitely find at least one more, which there I break even, but what if I find two or three more? Instead of getting 100% of one, I'm getting 50% of four. Yeah, well, and I agree that the idea of hiring (laughs) you have to, when you hire somebody, they have to be profitable to you, right? right? And I think for the most part, I looked at it at first as just a huge cost, right? If I'm, we a, all do, right? Oh, well, that hourly like, wage is a lot, lot of money. That's a cost. That's an expense, <laughs> but you need to design the job and make it so that it's not a cost. It's an ad, right? Yep. It's going to add to the bottom line by hiring that person. It's a huge leap of faith. I can remember physically you know, for almost everyone I've hired, every step I've taken from Mm -hmm. one employee to two and two to three, three to four, there's been so much angst, (laughs) emotional, you know, (laughs) going up to the the moment I offered him the job, just just Mm -hmm. absolutely sick to my stomach about bringing on another salary. Right. Oh, and you know what? I don't even think I've ever told you the story mm-hmm. about one of the employees I hired. I did not thoroughly think through what I wanted them to do. Mm-hmm. So they would show up and I'm like, I'm not exactly sure how to have you help me. And that one was a massive crash and burn. And so because of that, I got really gun shy for when <clears throat> yeah. I went to hire my next person. Cause I'm like, I didn't do it well. I'm a bad manager. I'm a bad hire. Yeah. I'm a bad delegator. And so that was something I needed to overcome. So I don't know if anybody can resonate with that out there, but that is a topic we're going to cover thoroughly here. Yeah, we're going to we're going to really get into delegating, onboarding and all of these processes. Right. Yep. Because we've both done it well and badly <laughs> quite a few times. <laughs> right. And uh, there's More a lot there's a lot to share on that. Right. So so the money is is definitely a big reason to, to hire a team. And I hope people will look at it and realize that it's not uh, a drain on your cash, it's going to add to your profits if you do it correctly. Right. And then we've already kind of covered item three, but our third benefit that we talked, we want to talk about today is that, you know, if you, if you want to time block, if you want to be proactive in your day, Mm -hmm. you have to have a team. It's a prerequisite. If you want to, I just remember, you know, my coaching program, they would say, okay, you got to spend you know, 20 plus hours a week prospecting and, <laughs> and, you're and like, you got to time block it in. That time? Well, yeah. I didn't, I was yeah. like, okay, I'll do it. I'll and do I it. block it out and I put these chunks on my calendar for prospecting and for going to lunches with referral partners and all this stuff. Yeah. And it would never happen. It would never happen because, yeah, because the time block would come up and suddenly you've got a fire you've got to put out yeah. and you have a client who needs something from you or have you ever found that you just don't feel like doing prospecting because mm-hmm. you've got not a lot of other important Every things to do day. too? Yeah. And it's easy to bump the task that's um, most important. It's funny. It's almost like the more important the task, the more our internal um, monkey brain or whatever you want to call it is like, no, mm-hmm. let's do something else. We really need to work on this other project. Well, I never thought about it as being, that's true though, that it's important and that might be one of the reasons why you avoid it, right? I think the reason, this is my belief in mm-hmm. this um, area, is that uh, when you do something that's really important, your life is going to change. Hmm. And our whole DNA, everything about us from the way that we were created, knows that change could be dangerous. And yeah. so your subconscious sabotages you to stay with what is familiar. Mm-hmm. So familiar is this income, this structure of life, this everything. And as we do something that's going to change that, um, subconsciously we're, we're scared, you know, the Mm -hmm. whole, um, 
change means that there might be a tiger and it might eat you, yeah. I think is the way that it was <laughs> described to me one time. And so we literally like fear for our lives. And so we sabotage ourselves without even realizing what we're doing. And so there's different tricks that we're going to talk about how to um, just. Yeah, I would love to have an episode that. about self-sabotage. That's been a really big topic for me over the years. Um, learning why I'm self-sabotaged. There's been times where I've quit my job and went somewhere else thinking it was a step up. And uh -huh. in, in hindsight, I knew that subconsciously I was getting too high on a tree that I felt like the limbs were going to break and I needed to get down to really? safety. Yeah. But I, that's, that's, that's the, that's the idea of a time block, right? If you have a time block, that's a proactive thing. That's really going to move the needle mm -hmm. and you have any of those subconscious fears, it's going to be very easy to skip that time block. Right. Right. And, if you don't have a team, you got a thousand excuses to skip that time block. It's like, well, I got <laughs> good four excuses. fires burning over here. I'm not going to ignore them to, mm -hmm. to prospect. And so I, I think probably for four years, I just mm -hmm. beat myself up because I was not sticking to my time blocks, right? I had this, I got to prospect. I got to go to lunches. I got to do whatever it was I had planned. Mm -hmm. I would never do it. And, and part of it I think was the subconscious and part of it was just, it was impossible. It was, it was yeah. unrealistic for me to expect to spend time doing those things when I had nobody to take care of the fires that were burning off yeah. on the side. We, we find ourselves when you're solopreneur, we are absolutely, like you said before, capped, mm -hmm. you know, there's only so much that we can do. And so building this team makes it possible to honor those time blocks that will change our lives. Yeah. And um, sometimes those time blocks are not just prospecting. Uh, the, some of the time blocks that are on my calendar that we'll be talking about in future episodes too is, um, so by the way, my business partner is Shannon Olson and mm -hmm. my name is Liz Sears. So our um, initials are SOLS. So our true corporation is Empowered Souls, spelled SOLS. Mm -hmm. And so we have a meeting every week called Empowered Souls. And that's where we um, do big picture planning. So we step back and we look at everything where are we at. So um, a very important time block is to work on your business, not just in your business. So mm -hmm. working in your business is prospecting. That's absolutely critical. And that is what makes it possible to work. It's basically the blood if you want to be you know pumping through your business that is going mm -hmm. to keep it alive and then we have our big picture meeting empowered souls and then you have to time block for your financials like you need to know your numbers if you meet an olympic athlete they know their numbers every single teeny little piece they know their numbers because if you want to improve and you want to be the best you can be you got to know your numbers mm -hmm. so you got to have you know, um, your financial meeting and there's ways that you can start out small and grow until you have your bookkeeper and your CFO. And by the way, a CFO is somebody who helps you interpret what your numbers mean. Mm. Like, yeah, we know how much we're spending everywhere, but what does it mean? How is that, um, guiding our business? Where is it going to be? Where do we need to tighten up? Where do we need to invest more? Where is our mm -hmm. ROI, blah, blah, blah on that. And so just making sure that inside of your week, you have time blocked the different segments, pieces that are going to grow you, your business to where you want it to be. And some of those are like 30 minutes. Some of them are one hour. Some of them are biweekly instead of every week. Right. Things like that. Yeah. I mean, what about just strategic planning for next year or next quarter? Uh -huh. Actually taking some int intentful time to sit down and decide what's our focus going to be yeah. for the fourth quarter of this year. If you're just slogging through the swamp of deals and whirlwind <laughs> all day, never happens. It never right? happens. And then you just are, you just keep repeat. Yeah. You will always repeat where you're at in your business unless you take time to identify and create the path of where you want to be next. Right. So, yeah. all right. And then into our fourth is fulfillment. And actually now that I read this, I'm like, we kind of did already touch on this one yeah. about how, um, the reason that you want to build a team is because you want to get yourself to where you can have uh, the biggest impact on the most amount of people of what works for you. So one of the things, in fact, this is a, it was interesting to me back in 2000, I think it was 15, end of 2015, end of 2017. I don't know. All of a sudden it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I was writing my new year's resolutions and as I was writing them out, um, because that was something I liked, even though some people poo poo, New Year's resolutions because mm -hmm. nobody ever sticks to them. Yeah. That was a good time for me to self-reflect on um, what was important to me. And I was writing them out and uh, realized that 
all of the training I had received before about what success looked like was uh, based on somebody else's definition. And as I was writing it out, I realized that those goals weren't mine and it wasn't fulfilling me. And so uh, what I decided to do was scrap writing out any New Year's resolutions and instead just truly identify what it's su- what does success mean to me? Hmm. And, and I just started doing bullet points. And so some of mine were that I wanted to be home with my kids till they left mm-hmm. to go to school. And I wanted to be home when they walked in the door at least a few days a week, even if it was just for 10, 15 minutes. Cause you know, having all boys, that's all they wanted me around anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to be home for dinner and I wanted to, um, have at least this many deals and I wanted to be healthy and I wanted time to, um, sleep. And I wanted, you know, I just started writing out all of these things, how much time I wanted to spend with friends. And when I was done, I was like, this actually help, causes me to write out slightly different goals than I have before. And as mm-hmm. I wrote them out, even though they were really similar, those little differences uh, changed my emotional connection to them. And my emotional connection to my goals changed how I behaved in doing what it took to reach them. Hmm. And so um, in reaching fulfillment, having a team uh, just makes all of that so much more possible because some of those pieces of things that I didn't love to do, this is the coolest thing in the whole world, secret. Every single task that you hate to do, there is someone who is crazy out there who loves to do it. Mm. And the task that you love to do, there is someone out there who thinks you are crazy. (laughs) And so building a team is also about finding those people who love to do the tasks that are important that aren't the ones you love to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and that's, for me on this topic of fulfillment, just it is very fulfilling to teach people this business. Right. right? To give yeah. them the gift of a career in the mortgage business, something that's supported me and my family and given me uh, all these great experiences and helped me meet so many wonderful people and provide for our family for 20 years now. Yeah. I'm finding more joy in teaching other people the business or as much joy as I get when I sit down with a client and teach them how to buy a house or help them rearrange their finances. Especially if they didn't think they could. I, when, you know, when I did mortgages, that was a piece that I found so freaking awesome is Mm -hmm. when they came in thinking that they were a year or two away, because that's what I'd always tell all my friends. I'm like, even if you think they're a year or two away, there's stuff they can do right now to get them on path to buy a house and have the best terms. And they'd come and sit down with me and say, are you serious? Yeah. Like I'm a month or two away. That's the same fulfilling of when someone tells me they want to be a loan officer. Yes. But they've never even, they don't know how to spell the word mortgage. (laughs) Right. And a lot of people don't. (laughs) So, so it's, uh, you know, we've, we've got a path for them, right? We've got, and this is part of my nature. I'm a, I'm a teacher at heart Mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm not maybe as driven towards the sales aspect as some people are. I'm more driven towards developing people and helping people. And so I've found just this whole new joy in in teaching. I remember my wife and I were at dinner. This is back when I was going to be a solo mortgage broker, right? Solo One man show, <laughs> solopreneur. And, and she kind of uh, challenged me or put that goal in my mind or realized it was my goal and made me speak it was, yeah. I want to help as many people as possible, right? And we've defined that since as clients and employees and realtors that partner with us. I want to help people grow and build their team, build their business, build their income. And I can find fulfillment in all three of those areas. It's just happened to be the last few years. Um, the place where we found the most fulfillment is with employees, hiring teams and helping yeah. other loan officers learn to build a team has been also really exciting. I love it. You know, that's, that's one of the things that kind of surprised me when Shannon and I um, started our brokerage we had actually hired a coach Mm -hmm. who owned, um, she didn't own a brokerage yet, but she owned a very successful team. And um, one of the comments, um, as we were hiring more admin, she said, you are way too admin heavy. It's gonna cost you too much money. That's not the way to run a team. You're gonna go under, so you need to tighten that up. And Mm -hmm. we said, well, everything that we wanna get, want our admin to do to support the team because it is our agent's team Mm -hmm. is how we viewed it. So by us building our admin staff, we have a built-in team for our agents to take advantage of as opposed to the traditional real Mm -hmm. estate brokerage where the agent does everything. So we wanted to help already have them step into a leveraged situation. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so this coach said, 
you're too admin heavy you need to taper down and we said well that's going to burn them out and she said yeah they burn out you like you have to replace your admin every two to three years sometimes mm -hmm. sooner than that and that did not sit well with me i was like that that's not what i want to create that doesn't sound fair to the people who work for me and then just talking about the agents i had witnessed that their agents would stay there until they outgrew um or until they burnt out mm -hmm. type concept and so um building a team the right way can make all the difference in the world and it was probably one of the coolest most rewarding moments when i had one of our admin because the way that we've structured how we've trained them how we've onboarded them how, how we um help them be as effective as we need is she told us at her one year um, review that she can't talk about work anymore with her friends or family <laughs> and I, said, <laughs> I said why not and she said because they think i joined a cult yeah <laughs> she can't stop talking about it yeah she's like wow. seriously i have not just drunk the kool-aid i am bathing in it and i'm yeah. quoting her on that wow. and that when you build the right type of company and you have the right type of um culture the culture makes everything, in fact, going into a different story. So I banked at two different banks and I'd walk into one of them and the people were nice, but they wouldn't um, say hi to me right away and they wouldn't make me feel like I was important to them. Mm -hmm. And even though they were kind, it was just is what it is. And then the other bank I banked at, the second you pull up to the drive through, they'd say, hi, welcome. I'll be with you in just a minute. It, you know, just to let me know that they saw me. And then they'd always ask me if I had any fun plans or, you know, what I was doing today or something like that, just some conversational thing. And when I'd go into their lobby, they'd offer me water. And it always was surprising to me how totally different the cultures were in those two banks. One was a credit union, one was a bank. Ironically, the bank was the one with the better customer service. And um, even as their staff turned, you know, new mm -hmm. people were there. The culture stayed the same. Mm -hmm. So you build your culture, you protect your culture, you teach your culture. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's actually really fun to do that too, right? Mm -hmm. Back to the rewarding work. There's a lot more that's rewarding about building a team. Leadership is rewarding, you know? Yes. And, and seeing something take wings is exciting. Something bigger yeah. than you. Seeing this organization that's bigger than you, that's better than you, that's just awesome. It's very fulfilling. Right. So let's just wrap this up. I want to just, I hope that the listeners feel inspired right now, that they want to build a team. Right? And if you're not yet inspired, just keep listening. <laughs> you, know you will be by the end. And we're going to, we're going to teach you how, or at least share with you how it's worked for us. And then we're going to bring guests in who have done it as well. Right. And we're going to pick their brains. We're going to ask them uh, how they did it, why they did it, when they did it, who was the first hire, the second hire, what's their hiring process like? Um, how do they onboard people and, you know, what are their successes and failures? I mean, beyond our own stories, we're going to be bringing you uh, over and over people who've done it. And if you want to build a team, stick with us. We're going to help you do it. We're going to help you have a better lifestyle, more income, right? We're going to help you finally stick to your time blocks. <laughs> finally, and find finally. that fulfillment that comes from building a business that's greater than you. Yep. And along the way, we're also going to share with you some hard knocks, things we learned the hard way so that you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And we're going to share with you nuggets of brilliance that fell into our lap or different things that we've learned that have really, really helped us propel our business forward even that much faster and our guests. And we're really excited to share this with you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, guys. Bye.